So hello, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tristy Taylor and I, um, I'm wearing two hats today. Uh, I was first <laughs> introduced to our guest, Daniel Dulski, through my work at New World Library. And I was very, very, very lucky and blessed to be assigned to her book to publicize it to the world. And uh, that was no accident, I think, on many levels. Uh, mm -hmm. including uh, everyone in the office knowing that I was a witchy lady, that my mm -hmm. spirituality is very uh, feminist, nature-based, creativity-based, um, very much into the moon. Everybody checks in with me in the office about uh, where the moon's at. <laughs> so I give the moon updates. Um, so when they, uh, when, uh, you know, so they, she peeks into my office and says, Tristy, you're going to be really excited about this book. And <laughs> right. And um, I got to read and uh, publicize Woman Most Wild, Three Keys to Liberating the Witch Within. So right off the bat, I want to just acknowledge that I'm Danielle's publicist, but I am also a huge fan of her work and her writing. I actually brought my uh, galley copy here to this uh, interview, which has uh, got a little bit of water on it, but you can see. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, this is like right away. I just started highlighting and post-its and not just for the work of bringing this book into the world, but for my own personal spiritual practice. So um, that's more the hat I'm wearing in this interview. Hi, <laughs> Hi, Tristy. <laughs> and you've just been the bestest publicist ever. <laughs> oh, thank you. I really, I, it's a passion. It's a passion. This book is a passion for me in wanting to bring it out into the world because we need, we need it more than ever. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with Danielle and her work and her book, I am going to direct you to kind of get to know her a little bit, a little intro possibly, because this conversation we're going to go a little bit deeper. So you might want to just kind of get a Cliff Notes version of uh, where she's at and what she's doing, and you can find out all about her on Daniel, DanielleDulski.com. And um, if you put her name in YouTube search, you'll see some very cool interviews with a whole variety of people, some of which I helped set up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can really kind of get the intro, the origin story. You know, it's all great. You should absolutely do it. And then come back here and go a little deeper with us. <laughs> uh, I really would love this to be kind of a witch to witch uh, interview. Um, awesome. and that's actually a great place to kind of dive in, um, because I was thinking about how very, okay, so in which, the witchy world, the pagan world, the druid world, the Wiccan world, I mean, there's a lot of branches. Yeah. And I find that fundamentalism exists in everywhere, in all spiritualities, yeah. in all dogmas. And something that I love about your book is that you are empowering your readers and your community and your friends to craft an authentic spiritual life that does not necessarily adhere to specific dogma. I mean, I think there are sort of basic ground rules um, in doing no harm and, you know, honoring your true authentic self, but there's um, such freedom. And I think that is really where the true authentic spiritual life often can lie, um, because everyone is different. Everyone has different needs. Everyone throughout their lives have different spiritual needs. Um, so, and I know that just from knowing you and knowing your, um, history a little bit, you've uh, definitely had some forays into the fundamentalist world. Yeah. Um, so I'm really fascinated to maybe start there of how you kind of transitioned 
from that more dogmatic repeat after me, there is only one way and it is this way, both in Christianity and when you started to open up your spiritual life to other ideas, and then how you found and continue to find, I'm sure, your way to this more creative, open, oops, free place. Every yeah. now and then the screen freezes, it makes me nervous, but we're living on the edge. It's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you'll just stop for a second and then come back. It's okay. <laughs> just trust that I'm going to reanimate it any minute. <laughs> um, yeah, I think like, you know, there's, we always have to be thinking about what it really means to be, to be on a feminist spiritual path and that the, the core aspect of that is choice. And so, like you said, freedom, that's what it's all about. And so even in, especially in, in, in um, the more patriarchal religions, but also in paganism that claims to be really feminist, there's always these mechanisms of oppression that have to be like dug out and looked at. And a lot of those come from always looking for a system right? Like there's, there's this really human part of us, I think. Um, and I don't know to what extent it's influenced by, by the patriarchy and like that left brain, like just wanting to have a real clear box for everything. Um, it's like labeled and tells you exactly where to put it. Um, but, but even that will, will influence witchcraft and paganism. This idea that there's like, this is the step-by-step -step way to cast a spell. This is what you do when it's this lunar phase. And this is what you do with this one. And, and like, there's a level of comfort in that, I think. That's, that's important. But then there's also this need to just constantly be questioning our beliefs. And, and where do they come from? That's the big thing. Like, I think that if we look at our spiritual beliefs we can, because they're relatively new, like the crown chakra forms during young adulthood. So it's not like these root chakra things about like survival and food that are really in there from um, before birth even. Our spiritual beliefs are comparatively new. So we can kind of trace those. And, and that's a real gift to be able to be like, well, I believe that, um, you know, I feel this way during the full moon and then I can link that to this evidence and that's how I know it's true for me. Like that's such an important practice that gets overlooked um, because, because witchcraft is like, it, it's like evidence-based kind of like, like witches want to want proof like we <laughs> we want to see that that our spells mean something and and I think like that's that's why like a big part of why I wanted to write this book and especially for women that are just coming to the craft because there's this sense of disempowerment that comes from other spiritual systems pagan included and and when there's Craft. One of the things is that they really have to believe they have the right to do this and that they can affect the world um, and that they have a, a real embodied magical agency. And, and, you know, to be able to link that to personal beliefs is so important and, and to be able to see how if it feels fluffy or if it feels not quite real, that maybe that's linked to somebody else's belief that they just told you when you were a little girl and you took it for granted. Um, so, so, you know, like my core message is like, you know, always be examining where your beliefs come from and especially the ones that start to feel limiting to you, even if they felt really liberating to you last week, <laughs> right? Totally. Um, cause we're always changing. So absolutely. Yeah. We're always transforming. And I mm -hmm. love that, um, well, specifically ritual work, but it's all related, of course, around cycles and community. Those the three keys that we you talk about in your book. Mm -hmm. um, but I, specifically thinking about ritual, probably because it's pretty fresh in my mind, because I recently did a, a healing grief ritual um, around the sudden loss of my husband. He's right there. Yeah, he's there. He is. <laughs> I was like setting things up and I just felt him just like, oh, I'm going to be a part of this interview. Like, okay. Showman. Such a showman. Yeah. <laughs> and so 
I recently did this very deep healing ritual and I spent months preparing it and even in the preparation of the ritual and kind of tuning in to what was needed, like one piece felt really important. And then like a month later, I was like, oh, I don't need that piece anymore. Like it was almost right. like the creating of the ritual was the ritual. And then the final ritual piece was sort of like the icing on the cake, like the celebration of all the ways the ritual worked and transformed me and just being in that space and planning and creating and making a costume to wear and feeling and thinking and um, knowing, like getting to know my own personal mythology a little bit more. And I think that's similar to what you were talking about of really like, what are our archetypes? You know, I, I grew up in a household that worked with dreams and did dream work. And that was um, a great early teaching for me of, you know, if you dream about a man in a gorilla suit, my man in a gorilla suit in my dream it could mean something very different from your man in a gorilla suit in your dream. And there may right. be insights we can share with each other, but it's still my personal symbol that means something to me. Um, and uh, ritual can be such a powerful way to honor movement in life, um, to express grief, feel grief, uh, to invite something new in. Um, when my husband and I, I were trying to have a baby and we tried for six years and oh, just did all that awful stuff with surgeries and mm -hmm. injections and <laughs> oh, it was brutal. Yeah. And then we finally got to a place where we decided to be child free, but I, and I had a dream about I was it was snowing and I was outside and I was looking into a hut and there are all these women circling this pregnant woman and they were all celebrating her and I realized that it was you know kind of a baby shower essentially and I woke mm -hmm. up like why don't I get that you know um yeah so I had an unbaby shower <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great powerful ritual around letting go of procreating in that way and really inviting yeah. in a different kind of nurturing and creating which was around our art and our art making and we really mm -hmm. embraced that that was where we were going to put that nurturing energy that and our kitty cats which are really mm. benefiting from all that uh, mothering energy from me yeah um so I, I wanted to talk to you about um, ritual specifically and how maybe what was your process in kind of discovering how ritual works for you and maybe possibly yeah. if it feels appropriate sharing a recent ritual you may have created. Mm. Yeah. Um it's interesting because I, I work with a lot of women that were raised like me in um, very uh, like evangelical Christian households. And, and I wasn't raised Catholic. I was raised born again Christian, but my mother was Catholic. And so she had in my room for some reason, she had like all of her um, old, you know, crucifixes and like the gold embossed books, like the prayer books and, and the rosaries and all of that. And, you know, it was things that we didn't have in born again Christian world, which was like a little bit more sparse and like less magical kind of. And I remember like looking through everything and, and oh, and she had come to this place where she really thought like Catholicism was sinful because it, it um, heralded Mary too much. That was her reason that Mary was, was too big of a deal in Catholicism. So even that was sinful. So, so of course, like that was interesting <laughs> as a little girl. Um, but like, I remember going through her things and like, like, you know, sneaking out of bed at night because they were in my room and like closing the door and going through like all of these. Um, she had this book that was like women of the Bible. And um, in my head, it was gigantic, but it probably wasn't that big. And it was like these color, color paintings of like the women from the Bible, like Esther and Ruth and, 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 and Mary and Mary Magdalene, who of course was like in red and she's like, you know, crazy looking. Um, 
but and then like the crucifixes and like the level of gold was crazy so so this sense of like you know oh what is this these magical things and then even in church and and we used to we had one church that we went to all the time but then we would change other ones regularly so i kind of went to church a lot as a little girl and that sense of majesty and like procession and the incense and and the gold candlesticks and all of that like and and like the christmas eve with with everybody holding the candles like all of that was beautiful and i love that and and it was just the message that was infused in everything that didn't seem right so so I do remember like kind of clinging to this idea of, of spiritual ritual, even as a young girl who was in a spiritual system that she even then knew that she didn't really agree with that much. So then, you know, getting older and, and coming into the craft and like, and yoga kind of came before that. And yoga had a sense of majesty and ceremony too sometimes, like the studios with the, you know, still gold statues, but different deity, right? And, and so like, you know, that was always um, kind of like a sense of coming home, but also not quite right. And so when I, when I started practicing my own craft, it was like, how do I get that that ritual, that sense of importance and, and, um, and kind of being held, right? Because ritual is like a very um, comfortable container that feels powerful and safe at the same time. And, and so, you know, when, when women are coming to the craft, it's that that they're after. They're, they're looking for that sense of how do I make this special, whatever it is, how do I make this transition special, or how do I make this spell seem special and and infuse that level of majesty in it that that other um you know spiritual traditions seem to have and and like they have that because they've had a lot of money <laughs> and, they've, and they've had a lot of time to and and they've had a lot of political support right and social support to 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 be able to bolster that and um and i think like that's that's always what we're after well we're, we're always after that sense of being held and and um it being special and it being ours. And, um, and so, yeah, so, so that's what ritual is to me. I'm trying to think of like the last really hardcore ritual that I did. I think, you know, ritual and spellcraft have kind of become one and the same for me. Um, that's a pretty recent uh, development, but just in the past year, I've, if I'm, if I'm doing some kind of a ritual on my own, probably a spell is part of it. I do a lot of ritual with other people that, that might not involve spell work. Um, but uh, so, so just in my own practice, the last ritual that I did was a few weeks ago. Um, I was talking with another witch. Um, her name's uh, Lara Rose Duong, and she's the money witch, and and she's great. So I just I'm part of her rich witch coven, and I led a circle for her. And before that, just kind of getting into it, um, I had a session with her, and we were talking about the witch's money wound, <laughs> and and how that's such a common common thing because you know we do feel by nature kind of more wild and free and, and less grounded. And so it's like, how do we have what we authentically value? Um, and, and how do we be okay with a capitalist system that's a little bit more masculine when we're so drawn to the feminine? So like, how do we remedy all of that? Um, so anyway, so, so working with her, we co-created a ritual for me where it was like, um, she works with uh, money honey pots. And so like figuring out like how much money honey I need in this pot and this pot and this pot. And it was very um, rigid, like as far as rituals usually go for me, it was like, well, I have to put this much money in this pot. And, and that was the idea behind it, right? Because money is so unforgiving. <laughs> So, so, so it was on purpose, but it was, it was uncomfortable for me. And, and it wasn't, I still got that sense of being held, but there was like this kind of like, this is new territory feeling. Um, but it was really good and it was elaborate. And, and I think that because so much planning went into it, um, that like the energy that I usually get from my body and from f feeling really like, you know, um, empowered and embodied in the ritual um i got that because i had put so much effort into the planning so so the energy kind of felt like it was coming from a different place but 
Um, but it, but it was really good. And I had, I still put some pieces in there that felt a little bit more like wild and, you know, I have to give some kind of wiggle room in here. <laughs> I'm going to go crazy. Um, so, so yeah, so, you know, it's interesting to think about like the difference between that, between like solitary self-designed ritual and then rituals that you do with other women. Um, and, and like, it's kind of the same as a women's circle because there's these rituals that, you do with say, you know, 10 to 12 different sisters who are there for you, right? Like, like maybe your ritual was that they're there to like hold space for you versus for it to really be like, we were holding each other in this space. Um, and, and those because everybody kind of sticks to vibe on the same frequency and even if because like when you bring women together that everybody's level of intention is exactly the same mm -hmm. um but but everybody starts to kind of be in exactly the same place you know regardless of where they started and so that's always really cool um and I guess like the last one, the, the last group ritual I did was a few months ago and it was a grad, graduation for teacher training. And so we do, in the advanced teacher training, we do cast a circle and, and um, it's very witchy. And anybody that comes has to know that it's very witchy and they have to be okay with that. <laughs> Um, but, but, you know, it's this idea of like, you know, this woman or the, in, in that case, it was two women, the, they're graduating, like they've done it. And, um, you know, it's a big celebration and, um, we do like a naming, like, this is how I see you. And, and that's always a really beautiful and emotional, um, practice because, um, you know, these women have like wept together for a year. <laughs> <laughs> and dance together and laugh together for a year. So, so yeah, so that's always a powerful ritual for me, but I get to do it a few times a year. So I'm lucky. Um, but yeah, I, I think like the biggest task with ritual is creating that sense of majesty and, and being held. And we're always after that. Um, and it's important. And, and it's like a bone deep longing that as humans, like we miss, like we really have in our collective unconscious, this, um, the call to ritual and it's like in there and even in our society now where um we're kind of ritual starved um and especially the feminine is is ritual starved we still have that and 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 when we come to it like when a woman first attends a moon circle for instance there's that sense of coming home and um and it's like ah oh, i know how to do this now i remember this is what i've been missing all of that yes there, there's a, a coming home, a coming home, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, there's so much popping into my head. I'm trying to um, <laughs> get, get the strands, but um, thinking about just everything you've spoken to and that yearning for ritual that I think everyone has deep in their souls um, and are trying to find it on some level, you know, depending on their comfort zone. Um, but you know, even just, I just think about, you know, like my friends that are smokers and the ritual they have and like the pack, yeah. how they get it ready and the way they light it. And, you know, just watching that happen. I mean, like, that's a ritual, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe the only yeah. one they have, but they have it and it's important to them. Um, yeah. And in uh, one of my many incarnations before finding myself at New World Library, um, and I still am a, an ordained interfaith minister, um, mm -hmm. and I did a lot of weddings. That was kind of my main gig, was being officiant mm -hmm. at weddings. And I always really tried to infuse the understanding that a wedding ceremony is a ritual. And so even having the most, you know, conservative couples, I mean, they, you know, in comparison, if they were having me marry them, they're not conservative, but, <laughs> uh, you know, compared to some of the like wild, naked, you know, forest weddings I've done, you know, some of the more yeah. church weddings, um, just really encouraging them to include something of their own creation, you know? many couples would just be like, okay, how do we do it? Like what's A, B, and C? And, and I, you know, of course I would tell them that, but I'd also say like, and, you know, like, what are you going to do? You know, what is authentically yours in this ritual? 
And it was really interesting and exciting to see these couples mm -hmm. kind of, you know, first there's fear and like worry and I don't want to do that. And we'd ride through that, you know, yeah. and then get to a place of like, it could be just that you write your own vows. It could be that, you know, you bring a photo of a beloved one who's passed away and you say a few words about her or, you know, it was really exciting to kind of invite this deep remembering back in of this is ritual this is yours and this is what you're creating together in front of witnesses which is really yeah. a beautiful thing to be a part of um yeah yeah i led a wedding in september it was my first oh, cool. one and i i got ordained in order to do it and um and well so she she was a student of mine for yoga teacher training and so she knew that I we'd do it like a soul marriage at the end of the basic teacher training so so she knew that I knew how to say things <laughs> um, but yeah but it was like that it was it was she's like I'm gonna give you complete freedom to do whatever you want and so like the weight of like I get to design a ceremony that's like a time honored ceremony, but I get to do it in my way. Like that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and like the audience, there was a lot of people there. Um, so yeah, so that's another like, you know, such a mega ritual that, you know, when you have the chance to make it really raw and like you said, authentic, like that's so amazing because there's so much that we just take for granted as part of like the marriage tradition now. Um, and a lot of it's incredibly expensive. <laughs> so, so when people get to like design their own ceremonies and like be able to see that it doesn't have to be like, you know, million dollar flowers and, uh, and, and, you know, catered and all of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, That's that awesome. actually makes me think about being a witch on a budget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is another thing. Like, you know, you don't need the, um, you don't need all of the crystal balls and, um, and every single herb stock. Like, I know, like, when I first started, I was like, well, I need, like, every herb. <laughs> I need to have jars full of every herb if I'm going to do this right. Otherwise, I'm just faking it. And, you know, like the amount of money that I spent on just tools at a time in my life when I did not have any money was ridiculous. And, you know, so that's another message that I always have for newer witches. Like, it, your craft shouldn't make you go broke in the first couple of weeks. Right. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. That yeah. makes me think about, you know, the, the creativity that we all need um, as witches and witches on a budget and, and, um, and really the gifts of, of looking around and being creative about what's around and what's available. And it makes me think about um, just being out in my little garden and my landlord was pulling weeds and I realized that he was pulling up all this stinging nettle. And I was like, you know, I think stinging nettle actually is kind of cool. Like it's got some cool things you can do with it. So I yeah. like looked it up and it turns out that it's great for asthma, which I have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so now, you know, I've been harvesting my own freely grown weeds of stinging nettle and making my own tea and doing stir fries with them, being sure to yeah. boil first everyone to get those stinging nettles off first before you consume it. Um, <laughs> but that, you know, and then going to the farmer's market and seeing these like big bunches of stinging nettle, you know, like $15. I was just like, that grows yeah. in your yard like a weed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone's buying it. Um, but it's, yeah. it's a good example of kind of another way that spirit works, you know, there are gifts everywhere and it's mm. kind of tuning into that frequency, that vibration, if you will, to kind of pay attention to the gifts that are being constantly offered. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it makes me think too about you know, when my husband suddenly passed away, it's going to be two years in August. It's coming mm -hmm. up. Um, and, you know, 
that first year is just pure grief. You know, it's just right. for me. Um, and I had, you know, I have a lot of witchy tuned in psychics, medium friends, and they're all like, Oh, Justin's coming and he's talking and he's, and I was just like, no, I'm not, I can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I right. Not yet. Like mm-hmm. I'm still mourning the loss of his incarnation as a big man in my life. Yeah. Um, so that kind of makes me think about what we're talking about of like, and the constant transformation that we're always living in, you know, there, there is going to be a time where I'm ready to really commune with him in his energy body. But yeah, I still, and he, you know, is at work. I mean, he wanted to be in this video, you know? Yeah. So there's little moments where I can kind of feel him and receive him and not completely break down into tears and fall on the floor. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. But there's, you know, it's, it, there, there are all of these levels working at the same time. And I think when I was first kind of tuning into my sort of baby witch self, I felt like, you know, even thinking about, I need all the herbs, like I need to commune on all levels and I need to hear all the messages and, you know, follow all the symbols I see. And, and it took me a while to just kind of rest in the knowledge that I'm going to experience and feel and be affected by whatever I'm going to be affected by. And, you know, I'm going to miss all sorts of stuff and they'll come around again. (laughs) Yeah. We it's all a cycle anyway. Um, Right. Exactly. Yeah. I think like um, that's a big part of psychic development too, is, is recognizing that it cycles and, and that everybody has different abilities. So, so right. So like, I remember when I first came to, it kind of all happened at the same time. I had my first son, um, decided to just completely come out as a witch, even though I had been for a while and, and then really started to hear dead people like, (laughs) like a lot and, and, and had no one really around to like support me through that and to help. And so it was really scary and and it was doing it all like, you know, with a tiny baby. So it was hard. Um, But, but then like just realizing that, you know, that's really the way it is for me every autumn. Like autumn is like, I hear dead people just as loudly as I hear regular people, living people. And, but that it's only that way for a relatively short period of time and then it goes away. And so, you know, or, you know, I have to work harder to get to that frequency the rest of the year. And so like, like looking at cycles of even those things that we think as, as integral to witchcraft and that like, we should be, we should have to do it all the time. It's not the way it is. Like, you know, even like call to ritual, like I feel, um, I feel like my rituals not just in what I'm doing, obviously, or like what the solar or lunar cycle is, but the way I'll create them is different. Like, like my summer rituals are like, well, I'm going to do this probably. And let's just see what happens. And like, they're usually really just like, um, they feel kind of light versus like my autumn rituals are like, I'm going to put the robe on. <laughs> I'm going to light all of the things and I need this and I need this. Right. So, so, I, and that, that doesn't make it more of a ritual necessarily because I've done all of that that it's just like that's the way it cycles so yeah so cycles are so important and and like I can never say that enough I feel like they're important with everything like 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 this you said that everybody in your workplace asks you about the moon like I have never received more messages emails and um and facebook messages and and phone calls even of like the help me which variety um (laughs) than I did these past couple days because this moon was so like unexpectedly nuts and for me too (laughs) and it was for me too so so people are like you know tell me what to do and I'm like I don't know (laughs) I'm right there with you I don't know Uh, but you know my advice was like all I can tell you is that this too shall pass (laughs) I know that it's not going to last forever um I know that it will at least shift by the new moon anyway even if we have to live with this for another couple of weeks um so yeah so like even like like you know stress and anxiety and all of that like you know it all just cycles in us all the time and and um 
I wish that like we taught that to kids in schools. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The, the, knowing the cycles in our bodies and our greater lives and our communities, you know, it it's so powerful to tune in and really deeply understand that. Um you know, I always post on my social media about the new moon when it's the new moon. And I always say everything ends and everything begins again, you know, and that's such a great teaching of the lunar cycle, which is related to all cycles, of course. Yeah. Um, it's, and it's so, it's so fascinating to see like in myself and in others who see that message every month, just what a, you know, what a relief, you know? <laughs> oh it's all yeah in. and it's like right and it's gonna begin again <laughs> yeah but it's gonna be slightly different it's gonna be exactly experience um and even like when I finally figured out my own menstrual cycle and mm. realized like oh okay like a week before I'm supposed to bleed things get a little intense you know like emotionally like I really kind of go up to 11 and you know, and before that, it would be like every month I'd be like, what's wrong with me? Because you know, yeah. it's going to last forever because that's mm -hmm. the present moment and that's mm -hmm. how it feels. Like I'm never going to feel any different than this and it's going to be awful forever. And it's like, oh, no, let's look at the calendar. No, it's going, everything changes. Everything changes. Everything changes. Um, yeah. And, you know, not to get too heavy, but this really popped in my head. So, you know, having a couple of friends who attempted to take their own lives and, and mm -hmm. thankfully did not succeed all echo that same thing. Like in the moment, mm -hmm. it just felt like I can't do this, you know, like right. in that moment they couldn't, you know, right. But living through it, finding the tools, surviving what they did, getting to a new place and being like, Oh, okay. It's not always feeling like that. Right. Maybe everything changes. Um, and we are constantly transforming. Right. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. this last moon. Yeah, I think. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, it was it, awful. It was just, I mean, I, I, maybe that's why the suicide stuff popped in because I was hearing a yeah. lot of that from people of just like, mm -hmm. uh -uh, like I didn't sign up yeah. for feelings. Like we're, things are bad enough. I don't need this mm -hmm. on top of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like, yeah, I've been talking to, and like, I've been talking to like a lot of witches too. And, and like, we're all kind of like, you know, this wasn't the way it was supposed to be. And it's like, you know, everything we think we know, <laughs> and it really means nothing. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I forget what I was going to say, but yeah, this past moon was, um, was awful. Oh, I remember. So like a lot of it, like the, the undervaluing of cycles, it really comes from, from our economic and, and social landscape. Like, like cycles aren't productive because, you know, we can't all, um, I mean, not just menstrual cycles, but for instance, women can't all not go to work, you know, the day before they get their period or whatever. Um, but you know, like the feminines and everything. So, so, you know, if you're, you're, feminine is more crone like and wants to be alone and still like that's not go going to serve the corporations to have people be like I'm taking a crone day and <laughs> I'm not going to be there right so so it hasn't served our socioeconomic landscape and so cycles get completely ignored and 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 so the message is you have to be exactly the same and predictable all the time otherwise you're worth nothing and 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 that's so damaging to the feminine psyche in everybody. It doesn't matter what gender you are. Um, so yeah, so like you know, granting yourself permission to feel completely different tomorrow than you did today, whether that's a good thing, whether that feels good or bad, you know, that's that's um, such a huge. Uh, it, it's such an empowering, I think, um, practice to be able to track your cycles. Um, yeah, and and like this past moon, I was trying to think of like what the lesson is. Like like we're, we're all all my witchy friends were like, "What's the lesson? What are we supposed to be learning here?" And the message I kept getting is from spirit was like, "Don't rush to the lesson. Like you're not gonna know for a little while. 
Um, and if the task is to sit in fruition with whatever this is, then just do that. Just like sit with what it is now and don't rush to like rationalize or, or, you know, try to figure out like, why me? (laughs) (laughs) Because it's really not going to help right now. Yeah, that actually really is a powerful point you're making um, Mm -hmm. in the sense that this work, this path um, is really, it's not, um, you know, A plus B equals C, you know, like I'm going to get these three enlightened pieces of information when I do this ritual, you know, it's really understanding the ebb and flow, the cycle of this kind of spirituality of honoring um, the wisdom as it comes. And, you know, the wisdom Mm -hmm. might take two decades to get here, you know, and it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, those two decades were wasted, you know, we're, we're in it. It's, it's not, it's not going to necessarily be this um, equation that is always reliable. You know, there's, um, there are pieces unraveling and opening on a variety of levels. And, you know, it makes me think about, you know, when I look at a powerful piece of art, like I think about like the paintings of Frida Kahlo and I, you know, there's such a huge, huge influence on me and who I am as an artist and as a woman and, um, and thinking about like the, Frida didn't know that, you know, when she was making those paintings, like, she had no idea the ripples of her, what I think very magical art practice would create in the world. And, you know, she's long gone from this earthly plane, but her work continues and transforms, you know, new people. Like there's young girls discovering her art for the first time right now on Tumblr, probably. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right. And she had no idea what Tumblr was. (laughs) And that's a good piece to remember too about you know, especially all my friends in the arts and, and, um, you know, spiritual work that doesn't necessarily get celebrated or financially honored in the way it should Mm -hmm. be. Um, and just really like, Oh, you know, what's the point? What's the point, you know? And, um, doing ritual work where, you know, you do this whole, I, you know, elaborate thing and then sort, and then I like do the laundry, (laughs) like wash the dishes, you know, like as Jack Right. Does. like after the ecstasy the laundry you know like yeah we are still living in this world and uh get have to get mm-hmm. things done and um you know we're not gonna have necessarily sometimes it happens but we're not gonna have like this shock and you know like mm-hmm. here's what it all means you know so when you were talking about yeah. doing it, that made me think about that of like grinding away on like what does it mean what does it mean and it's like well how about just letting it unfold and we'll see yeah or we want right to. right <laughs> yeah and like chances are like if you're gonna get that crazy in your face mess it'll come when you're doing the dishes right? <laughs> or the laundry and not when you're in ritual right. <laughs> yeah yeah because um, it is constantly but, unfolding and being in that being in that space allowing that space to exist you know like you, you were sort of describing like you know the linear path and how it, it doesn't necessarily jive in this kind of spiritual work although there's a layer of that that's truth as well but thinking about mm-hmm. the spiral you know the an mm-hmm. ancient, ancient symbol you know of women's spirituality of ancient mm-hmm. art um, I was very, very lucky in my 20s to go to Malta and actually go in one of the ancient goddess caves that oh, I cool. rolled down. Um, and it was like stunning to be in that space mm-hmm. and to really connect with this ancient understanding that it's not a linear path, it's a spiral path. And, you know, we may feel and do the exact same things but we're in a deeper layer of the spiral and it means something completely different than the last time we did that moon ritual or whatever it is yeah um right yeah I think like you know 
it's it's always that it's always try, trying to figure out like what's predictable what's true for me sorry cattail um Not what's cat. predictable <laughs> what's true for me and and then what has to change from last time and and that like i was talking before about like how witches really like proof like yeah. you know if i look back for the past say you know 12 or you know 12 to 15 years or even if you count the little mini rituals that I did as a teenager so like however many decades of ritual I have always gotten everything that I wanted yeah. now rarely did I have gotten it like exactly when I thought I needed it right um so it's like it's goddess time or it's it's fem time and it's just not you know it's not the same as the, the time that's on our iphones <laughs> I it's like just them different. Time. That's good. Them time. That. <laughs> and since your um, little kitty cat made an appearance and actually yeah. made down by my feet trying to jump in my lap. <laughs> not, it's not time for that. Um, I did actually want, yeah, she's back. Um, I wanted to talk actually about having familiars, um, mm -hmm. having furry creatures in our lives to help remind us about um well i'll speak for myself and my furry creatures they're mm -hmm. really um they remind me so much about going outside being in nature um yeah. they're really <laughs> they often bring me blood sacrifices <laughs> <laughs> yeah when i did my ritual my healing ritual you know there was a circle and i did a bunch of stuff in the middle of the circle and as we were moving outside to do an outside piece my little girl cat came in with a giant gopher in her mouth, plopped right down in that center of the circle and just broke its neck. <laughs> and I was like, oh, blood sacrifice. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's what, that's what everybody else was too afraid to do. And she's yeah. like, I got it. <laughs> You know, I live um, way out in the boonies, which I love being a nature mm -hmm. witch. Um, but that also does mean um, challenges with plumbing and water and right. uh, electricity. Um, mm -hmm. And so for a while, I didn't have any running water. And um, mm -hmm. so I was, you know, peeing a lot outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was out there with my kitty. And she, I mean, she literally was teaching me something. And she walked over to a gopher hole and she peed in the gopher mm -hmm. hole and then she like waited for me to <laughs> and I was like, okay. yeah. <laughs> handle the gophers mom like this is what we do like they don't like our yeah. pee, so we pee in their holes oh that's awesome how smart she is <laughs> yeah and you know she yeah always, we have they both get so excited when I do ritual. Like if I like yeah. handle, they both like come and are mm -hmm. like, you need us here, you know? <laughs> yeah, I was, so I was, I have a dog and a cat and I, I would call my, my other cat, who's my current cat's sister. So I had two of them. Um, I would call her my familiar, but she died um, two years ago. So I still have her sister left and her sister is now 20 years old. So wow. she's an old cat. So I have her and then I have my, and, and she has like Benjamin Button's disease. Like she keeps getting younger and younger and fatter and fatter. <laughs> and I think that that's from all of the magic work. So I was told a while ago, a few years ago, that cats bring, you know, cats are really feminine and they bring this energy into circle and magic and dogs will take it away and that they know that, that dogs know that. So I do have a dog who I love, but you know, the energy of a dog is just completely different. And so whenever I do anything, like if I light, sometimes if I light a candle, even my dog's like, I'm out of here. I want nothing to do with this. <laughs> I know that this is not for me. I'm gone. And my cat gets really into it and she'll like stay there. And she's been with me really the, the whole time through my whole path as a witch almost she's been with me. Um, but there's a cat at my yoga studio, Guinevere, and Guinevere is something special. <laughs> she's, she's not that old. I think she's like eight or nine years old. And um, she will sit in women's circle and has for years. Um, there was a time uh, about two years ago where she ate something and she was like on the verge of death. 
And I brought her into the garage and I like brought all the magic I had. I like, I called in Artemis. I was in there with her for hours and she was fine the next day. And not only fine, but like now she's been like (laughs) completely vital and like kind of nasty and like, you know, um, like think she owns the place since then. And I just know that it's like my fault. I know that like, you know, because of that ritual, she is now like infused with Artemis as goddess. And, you know, she basically thinks she has an antler crown on her head <laughs> all the time and, and she's immortal and she's never going to die. <laughs> And I haven't told any of that to her owner because her owner's like, I don't understand why, you know, she's acting this way or or how she's like miraculously okay now. And I'm like, I do. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah. (laughs) And sometimes like, we'll just look at each other and I know she's like, I remember what you did for me. And I'm like, yep, you're welcome. karma points in the cat feline community yeah (laughs) (laughs) yep Guinevere that's amazing (laughs) um so we are sort of winding down here I want to be definitely very aware of your time because I know you're a very (laughs) lady um, but I dev- I wanted to talk a little bit about the new uh, course that you've created to companion mm-hmm. women most wild, women most wild rising. Um, mm-hmm. I'm super excited that you're doing this because uh, it's I'm as you mentioned, you know, you you uh, your book is so accessible. It it makes sense that you're kind of. Uh, blasting open some baby witches uh hearts and souls and really kind of inviting them deeper in and i can imagine that that's a little bit scary so it's cool yeah. that you've created this companion course for um those folks that want to start exploring you know what this mean what this spirituality means to them what they can create for themselves and um you know, just taking just an initial look at the, cause there's a little, um, like a free sort of introductory yeah. that you're, you have online, which is great. And danielledulski.com, you can find out about all of that. Um, and it's, I love that you're keeping, um, that freedom in there. You know, you've got, mm-hmm. you're kind of, you know, they're like cairns on the path, you know, they're like the little sort of, you know, stone monuments of like, okay, this is a truth here, and this is a truth here, and the path is yours, you know, we're empowered to really walk our own authentic paths, um, which is not easy to do, so I'm really, again, you know, so impressed by the work you're doing, and the deep empowerment that you're offering in this spirituality, in this practice, in this invitation to a wild place inside all of us uh you know men women and beyond the gender binary really and I love Mm -hmm. that you really honor that as well Mm -hmm. um so can you maybe just here at the tail end of our talk um just share a little bit about that companion course and what what folks who sign up can expect to experience Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's 12 lessons. So it's one lesson for each chapter of the book. So, so it really is like a true companion course. Like you have to have the book and then each lesson has, um, five different parts. So there's, there's like a kind of introduction, like, like fire starter that just kind of like, is like, this is the spark. This is what this lesson's about. And then there's some personal myth work, um, usually some meditation or, or a body prayer, like some, some kind of physical movement to do. Um, and then some kind of ritual or ceremony that you create yourself. So, so the reason why I think the course is so cool is because it isn't like, uh, like a witch training. It isn't like I'm going to give you exactly what spell to do for when or what. It's like, let's try to, you know, hold as much digital space for you as I can to like learn how to write your own spells and, and, and create your own rituals because 
that way, you know, the possibilities are infinite, like learn how to do it yourself. And then you don't need to be told like what ingredients you need or whatever. Um, and that was another big part of it. Like I didn't want it to be like, you know, I had a 20 ingredient supply list for every lesson. So, so all you need is a journal that can be your book of light and shadow. And then sometimes there's like tea lights or something required, but it's not like a materials heavy course. So really just the book in a journal is, is good. Um, and, and so, you know, working with the lessons, the first four lessons are all about working with the lunar and solar cycles. And, and it's very um, accessible, so it doesn't matter like what hemisphere you're in, uh, which is another important um, thing in witchcraft is to not ignore the people that live in the Southern Hemisphere because they're completely opposite of where we are. Um, but like right now, solstice is a solstice. Like those are stopping points, whether it's winter or summer. Um, so those are the first four. And then the middle four lessons are about creating spells and rituals and, and using um, personal myth work in order to create spells, which is a practice that I do a lot for me. So like, you know, just kind of free writing and not really worrying about grammar or spelling or where it's going. And then using that as a basis for your spell craft as a really, um, uh, it, 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 I think, in working with women, that, that's something that makes it very accessible for them. It's how they're like, oh, okay, so I, this is how I make this mine with my words, words or spellings, right? And then the final four lessons are about um, creating a, a women's circle or witch's circle if you feel called to do that and how to do that and, and how to kind of manage the communication in a way that's very feminine and not masculine, which is the way we're used to communicating in our society. And, and then the last piece is like, you know, now that you've, you've been given, you know, these tools and, and able to kind of figure out how they're personally meaningful for you, you know, how much do you want to be in a circle and how much do you want to be a lone wolf woman and on your own and then like navigating that and, and figuring out um, how to really tune into self and, and know like, well, I don't really feel like going to coven tonight, or I don't really feel like, you know, being alone tonight, you know, that all of the, that, that requires like a, a, a real practice of introspection. That's, that's really important for, for witches, whether they've been doing it for 50 years or whether it's been like a couple of weeks. Um, and then, you know, the, the methodology there, so there's like PDFs for each of the lessons. And then there's also introductory videos for each, um, key. So there's, there's, um, I think five different videos. So there's, there's one for each key and then there's an introduction and a conclusion. And then there's guided meditation. So, so like a lot of people in reading the book, I've been getting messages where they're like, I wish that I like had this, you know, that I could like hear you. So, so there's the same in the book. There are different meditations that can just be listened to um, via audio. And, and then I added um, a solstice by, so it's actually a 20 minute yoga practice led by me um, that's kind of like a bonus at the end. And I'm going to keep adding those as we go. So like I'll do one for the fall equinox and then again for spring um, or again for winter and then again for spring. So there'll be four of those total. Um, but yeah, the, I, I'm really excited about the course because I haven't had a way to like really hold space beyond the book for people that aren't like near me or like, you know, wherever I go. So, um, so I think it's really cool and the feedback's been awesome so far. So it's good. <laughs> oh, so good. I'm so, so excited that you're doing that. It's really exhilarating. And, um, I know we can't say too much about it, but, um, mm -hmm. I'm very excited to know that we're going to keep working together. Into the future. <laughs> yeah. Um, super, super excited to see, uh, what comes next and, um, mm -hmm. how it all unfolds, um, in your, what you're offering the world and, um, what it's going to inspire and is inspiring to all the people working with you. Um, I just think you're such a gift and such a wonderful person and just really, you've just got the right, you're just in the right place at the right time. I, <laughs> it's exciting. I just feel really excited to, you know, have a very small role in um, helping get your work out into the world. It's just, it, it feels like a blessing for me to be a part of. 
Yeah. Oh, awesome. I'm so glad. And it's been like when I remember the first phone call where you were like, I'm a hereditary witch, like Lithuanian heritage or something. And I was like, what? (laughs) That was not what I was expecting from the first marketing call. (laughs) I don't like I had, I like was slightly Uh, Yeah, I was like, I was slightly nervous about it. And I had talked to my agent, um, like an hour before as like preparation and like everything that she told me was like, you know, to be really like kind of rigid and professional and, and, you know, and all of that. Um, Yeah. And then you're like, I'm a witch. I was like, okay. (laughs) Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, New World Library is a very special place on many levels, including uh, being completely free to be a witch there, which is really a blessing. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So as we are uh, ending this wonderful call and connection uh, today, is there anything uh, else that you'd like to say or speak to? Um, no, I, I mean, I've, um, whenever the final interview question is like, what's your message for women who are, <laughs> who are looking to come out as a witch? Um, my, my go-to advice is to look to those moments from childhood where you really felt like you were the most you. And, um, if they, a lot of those involve nature and like a sense of the ethereal and magic that, that you might be being called to the craft. Like if there's this sense of a spiritual void and that like just straight atheism doesn't seem quite right. Like, just like give it a shot and see how it feels like, you know, try on the craft and see if it feels like coming home yeah and it will (laughs) because it does (laughs) absolutely beautiful well thank you daniel dolsky i'm so glad Mm. we could have this conversation today and um i'm gonna follow up with you because you mentioned a lot of really cool things like the money witch and some other Mm -hmm. resources that folks might be interested in and um i'm gonna post this interview Mm on my own uh, radio website, spillingrubies.com. So uh, on that page, I'll have uh, resources for folks to click on, including uh, finding out more about your book, finding out more about your course that goes with the book, and all kinds of juicy good stuff. So. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) And you and I will be talking soon, I'm sure. Many emails to come. Yes. (laughs) And yes. <laughs> I wish you all the best until we talk again. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tristy. <laughs>